You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So, as promised, today we're going to be looking at defensive tackles because, as I said yesterday, it does seem that Mike Pettin really likes defensive tackles. This is a very defensive tackle-heavy draft. And so, uh, it's not uploaded yet, but I did do a really, really big uh, positional ranking for all the defensive tackles I've got. Let me see here. I've got 34 defensive tackles. So we're going to look over that list a little bit. Maybe try to take a little bit of a look at um, some potential. I'm not going to use that word. Some good fits for the Green Bay Packers. Some different options. We'll look at guys that are a little more pass rush uh, adept, a little better at the run, maybe a little bit of both, whatever. And then, as always, if you're interested in getting this list. For as little as a buck a month on Patreon, uh, you can have the full list. Uh, as of right now, let me take a look here. I've got quarterback, wide receiver, uh, the entire offensive line, tackle, guard, center, tight ends, defensive tackles, linebackers, edge rushers, and safeties. I think cornerback is going to be next on the list. I've been wanting to do that for a while, but, uh, you know, stuff just keeps coming up. But otherwise, before we get started, be sure to get into the Facebook group. Um, check out NFLBigBoard.com. I think next week I'm going to finish off uh, the... The NFL Big Board ranking, that'll be my last update. So I'm going to do one more, and that's it, before the draft. And then the next the next time you go there, uh, post-draft, the next time I update it, is going to be a 2020 uh, NFL Big Board. So hopefully I'll have that up uh, after the draft is complete. Otherwise, if you have any questions for the show or would like to get something off your chest, be sure to call 608-501-0718. Text or call 608-501-0718. The only other thing I wanted to mention, um, somebody, actually two different people now have said that there is a problem with the volume for these advertisements. I don't actually directly control that. I'm going to reach out to the people that do and see if there's anything we can do about that. Um, in the meantime, though, what I think I'm going to do, uh, basically all I do is I put little spots in the podcast and say, this would be a spot for an ad. This is a spot. This is a spot. And I have no idea where it's actually going to end up because I think I only have one ad running, but I put like three different spots in there. So what I'll do is I'll try to remember to just give a heads up, say something to the effect of, you know, take a quick break or whatever. And then if there's an ad, there's an ad. If there's not, then, you know, whatever. But it'll at least give you a little bit of a heads up because two different people now have said that out of nowhere, there's like this deafening loud noise that comes blasting into your ears. So I apologize for that. And uh, again, I'll try to see what I can do about it. But with that, I think we'll take a break. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data 
So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Was there an ad there? Either way, let's take a look at these defensive tackles. So as I said, I've got 34 different defensive tackles. Um, the grading system worked out pretty well. It's, it's pretty close to what I would have expected. The only kind of shockers, I guess, or not really shockers, but things that are surprising or maybe not the way that I would have laid them out. Um, Christian Wilkins and Dexter Lawrence are both numbers two and three. They're both uh, after Quinnen. Ed Oliver comes in sixth. So I'll read off the top ten to you and then give you a couple other maybe potential shockers. Quinnen Williams, Christian Wilkins, Dexter Lawrence, Jeffrey Simmons, Rashawn Gary. I know he's more of an edge guy, but I wanted to put him here anyways because I just, you know, whatever. I'll put him in both. Greg Gaines, Ed Oliver, Michael Dogby, Tristan Hill, Draymond Jones. So out of that list, first of all, Greg Gaines is maybe the most underrated prospect in the draft. He's he's widely regarded by anybody that you ask as a freakish defensive tackle. Very, very good player out of Washington. Pro Football Focus rated him as elite. As I've said, there's not that many elite prospects in this draft class. Out of over 500 guys, there's maybe 10 to 15 elite prospects. Greg Gaines is one of them. Freakish. We'll talk about him. Um, of the guys that I don't even really know very well, Michael Dogby out of Temple, Tristan Hill out of UFC. Some of the guys that, um, or you know, one or two of the guys that I wasn't super thrilled with, Jerry Tillery came in 12th. We'll talk about why in a little bit, but that one hurts my heart. Rennell Wren was 26th, just a dagger right in my eyeball. And again, this isn't anything official. This is me, again, what, what I do is I take all the metrics that I think are important and then I weight them differently. So strength of schedule, uh, pass rush ability, run stop ability. Then you've got some more advanced metrics, pass rush productivity, um, run stop percentage, which as I've said before, stop is, is a something that is considered a negative grade for the offense and that was caused by this person. So less than four yards on first down, stopping a, preventing a first on third or fourth down and then something on second, I don't know. So the, the percentage of times you do that, the pass rush percentage, which is the metric that I like to use, which is just taking all of the, it's similar to pros, pass rush productivity. So what I like is the pass rush percentage and it's the number that I keep giving you guys where I say you want to at least get to 10% of the time you get some kind of a pressure. A pressure is a hit, a hurry, or a sack. 10% is kind of that baseline. You get up into 12%. That's where your our Smiths are. Preston and Zadarius are in that 12% range. That's a solid number. You get too much higher than that, you're getting into really, really good territory. And then 15 to 20 or above is elite. So that's my metric. Pass rush productivity is basically that exact thing, but it weights it differently. So sacks are worth more than hurries. But then what I do is I take these different metrics and I weight them based on what I think is most important. So the... Um, you know, the actual grades that PFF puts on them, I weight a little higher, and then how I weight run versus pass rush, you, you get what I'm saying, right? And then also relative athletic score, I weight that differently based on position. Like I said yesterday, I don't put a lot of emphasis on that for quarterbacks. I do put more of it on defensive tackles and even more of it maybe on pass rushers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not an exact formula. However, as I've also said in the past, whenever I see something not quite right, I'll try to tweak the formula and it doesn't change all of that much. So basically, if you use these metrics, this is pretty much going to be the order with the exception of a couple tweaks here and there. But Quinn and Williams, no matter what you do, is always going to be number one. Lawrence and Wilkins are always going to be very high. Jeffrey Simmons is going to be very high. There's basically nothing I can do to bring Rennell Wren up into the top 10. That's just never going to happen as much as I might want it to happen. So this is what it is. So first of all, let's talk about the freak himself. I've already talked about it, but Chris, uh, Quinn and Williams. So um, the total grades are just kind of numbers. As I've said, maybe starting next year, what I want to do is find a way to make it comparable so I can make a full big board. In other words, I have to be able to compare defensive tackles to quarterbacks, to wide receivers, etc. But his arbitrary grade was 115. The next highest by Christian Wilkins was 104. So huge difference. Um, he plays for Alabama, so strength of schedule, obviously, number one. Elite pass rush ability, elite run stop ability, pass rush productivity was a perfect 10, um, highest uh, run stop percentage of anybody in the class, uh, and highest pass rush percentage at 16.97, which again is 16.97% of the time he's getting some kind of a pressure on the quarterback. In other words, he literally ranked number one in every single category. I don't think that's been true of any prospect that I've done so far. Quinn and Williams, number one in every... Ca oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, he's fourth in relative athletic score. Rashawn Gary's number one, then Ed Oliver, then Dexter Lawrence, then Quinn and Williams. But he's still a freak, <laughs> athletically. 
So outside of relative athletic score, he's literally number one in every category. So as I've said, if by some miracle, or, or not even a miracle, if the Packers did decide to move up to three or four or whatever Quinnen is to get Quinnen, not going to be super upset. As much as I love the picks, I want to have as many picks as possible and be able to get as many of these guys, as I've said, from you know 15 to 60 or whatever. I'm just not going to cry about that because the guy's a freak. After that, I actually want to skip down to Ed Oliver because I'm sure that's the one that a lot of people are going to be kind of upset about because he should be easily the best, blah, 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 right? Here's the situation. It's productivity that's going to hurt him. It's his numbers. He doesn't have good numbers. Actually, also shockingly, PFF graded him as a better run blocker, or excuse me, a better against the run than against the pass, which again isn't all that surprising if you really think about it because... Again, the numbers. What has he actually been able to do as a Pat? We know he's athletic, but what does he do about it? What does he do with it? He Go look at his numbers. Go look at his sack numbers. They're not good. So he's not bad, but just to give you an idea, he rated uh, ranked sixth, uh, according to his PFF rush ability, pass rush ability. He had the second highest run grade next to Quinn and Williams. His pass rush productivity, though, again, this is PFF's metric on, you know, percentage of times that he got a sack hit or hurry but also weights sacks higher than hits hits higher than hurries right he graded out 15th run stop percentage he graded 13th pass rush percentage which is basically pass rush productivity but not weighted he graded 14th so he's pretty solid and obviously he's an athletic freak as we know but overall when you take all this stuff into account he came out seventh so again it is what it is and it's sort of the reason why i like ed oliver but I just, I, I just have concerns about him. I know he's an absolute freak, but so is Dexter Lawrence. So is Christian Wilkins. So, so are a lot of these guys. He's also a lot smaller. There's a lot of questions about his, his productivity. There's questions about his size. There's questions about his run-stopping ability. There's questions about him being able to two-gap in a 3-4 defense. So, you know, again, if Ed Oliver's there at 12 and we trade back, I'm not going to riot and burn Madison to the ground. I just don't have any interest in that. I'm just going to kind of shrug my shoulders and go, eh, yeah, I can kind of see that. For the record, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys that did not have relative athletic scores. I gave them filler numbers, which means they could be a little bit higher, they could be lower. Uh, Jeffrey Simmons was one of them. But I tend to err on the side of being low because I'd rather, you know, grade them a little lower for not running it than give them an inflated grade. But I want to introduce you, if you haven't seen him already, to the guy that is currently sixth on this board, one step ahead of Ed Oliver, Mr. Greg Gaines out of Washington. So first of all, whenever I think about Washington defensive tackles, I think about these gigantic 335-pound Samoan-looking guys. But Mr. Gaines is 6'1", 312, so he's not, he's not, uh, not outside of the realm of, of a size type of guy that I would expect the Green Bay Packers to get. Now, in terms of his athleticism, this could be a negative because he did get a 6.66. So depending on how much the Packers are still hung up on athleticism overall, that could end, end up being somewhat of a problem. With that said, though, Kenny Clark had a relative athletic score of 7.33, which is higher, but it's not, you know, he wasn't in the 8s or 9s and we took him in the first, first round, so it's not the end of the world. Looking at what he does really well, He's not nearly as good of a pass rusher as he is a run stopper, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying about uh, Muhammad Wilkerson. I don't think Muhammad Wilkerson was brought on to the Green Bay Packers to be a pass rusher. There was a time at which Muhammad Wilkerson was decent at that, but over the last several years, if he's good at anything, it's stopping the run. So if we're looking at it and saying we want a big guy to go in to complement Kenny Clark and Mike Daniels, to be able to, as I said yesterday, to be able to come in and be that big-bodied presence up front to make sure that we can play light, we can play nickel and dime defense and not have to worry about getting run all over because we got big monsters up front that really handle their business. Greg Gaines graded out as the fourth-best run-stopping defensive tackle behind Quinnen Williams, Ed Oliver, and Christian Wilkins. With that being said, however, he did have a 12.2 pass rush percentage which I know college isn't the pros, but that's right up there with what Kenny Clark gets, with what Mike Daniels gets, with what Preston and Zadarius Smith get. If he can even be kind of close to that in the pros, he's going to be pass rushing as well as just about anybody else, on top of being just a massive, monstrous, run-stopping phenom. So Greg Gaines is a monster. And again, I know he's not talked about all that much, but I think there's a chance that he could surprise... Um, currently on NFL Big Board, he's graded or ranked 142nd, which would make him a fifth-round prospect. I don't think it would be all that shocking, to me anyways, if he went in the second round. 
Uh, looking at the other guys that aren't quite as well known, Michael Dogby out of Temple. I think he and Tristan Hill are actually pretty similar, at least in terms of, of my uh, my board here, because they're not really super elite in any one category, but they're pretty kind of average across the board. Neither of them are super great pass rushers, slightly better run defenders. Michael Dogby is a pretty solid run defender. Both of them right at around 11%. Tristan Hill a little bit higher, 11.87. Dogby 11.27. And both of them rated at about 9 for relative athletic score. Uh, the one thing I do know about Tristan Hill is that he's got a little bit of a personality and not in a good way. Apparently he didn't get along with his coaches, kind of threw a fit about his playing time, left on bad terms with his team. So I'm going to say it's probably pretty unlikely that Tristan Hill is going to be one of the guys. But I think if you're looking for just a steady, solid, lesser-known prospect that's maybe going to be somewhat in the later round, you know, Temple being a smaller school, um, I'm assuming I'm saying his name right. I should probably look it up, but I won't. Yeah, a a mid-round guy, if we didn't want to go first, second, third round, whatever, to get a defensive tackle, Michael Dogby. I'll just mix it up. I'll hit it one of these times. Uh, yeah, Dagobe is a pretty good mid-round guy that we could probably pick up. Doug B.A. <laughs> Whatever. So the most painful thing over this list is that uh, Gerald Willis, the guy that I haven't been too fond of, is actually one step ahead of Mr. Jerry Tillery, who was one of my favorite defensive tackles in this class. Here's the, here's the thing with Jerry Tillery. Jerry Tillery is a phenomenal pass rusher. Not a very good defensive tackle against the run. So if you're looking for a Draymond Jones kind of guy, at least in terms of what I'm looking at here, but exaggerated, even better against the pass than Draymond, but not even quite as good against the run as Draymond is, it's Jerry Tillery out of Notre Dame. That's actually the the other really cool thing about this is with this sheet on draft day, if, for example, the Packers did take Jerry Tillery, it's very obvious what they were looking for. They're looking for more pass rush, and they're looking to get it along the defensive line. And that couldn't be any more obvious with a pick like Jerry Tillery. He was actually tied. I, I want to say second highest pass rush grade. Tied. Tied with Quinn and Williams. However, run defense grade, 24th. Pass rush productivity, he was fifth. He's also fifth as far as his uh, pass rush percentage at 12.24. Again, we're in that top tier territory. Whereas, again, if you're looking for more run stop but not caring as much about pass rush, Greg Gaines, right? So I'm kind of beyond excited to uh, test this thing out during the draft. Which, by the way, forgot to mention, um, as I've said before, 150 reviews. We can get there today if we can just get, what is it, 29 more reviews, something like that? 29 more five-star reviews, and I'll be doing a live stream. Now, here's the other little caveat. Yeah, I said it wrong. Do what I want. But Mr. Kyle has said if we do not get to 150 reviews, he's willing to pay for my pizza to do the live stream anyways. So I think you guys should do them all a favor because I plan on eating all the pizza. Save his pocketbook and just get to that 150 reviews. That way I can do the live stream and I don't have to take the man's hard-earned money. However, (laughs) because he's getting me excited now, I will be taking donations for gluttony if we'd rather go that route. In other words, I don't want to leave you a five-star review. I would rather pay for you to hurt yourself with food I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay with that. Talk amongst yourselves. Moving on. Oh, yeah, ad right here. Cover your ears. Heads up. All right, so I wanted to do a little bit of an exercise. I wanted to look at some of the draft picks in the past that have taken place in places where Matt LaFleur was and see if there are any kind of comps for this year's draft class. Unfortunately, Last year, the Titans had almost no draft picks, and pretty much every single one of them was defense. To be specific, their draft picks were Rashawn Evans, Harold Landry, Dane Cruikshank, Luke Falk. The end. So we kind of did it yesterday already, looking for potential quarterback uh, pickups, and um, came up with one name. But let's take a look at Luke Falk and see who the Luke Falk of this draft is to see. Because again, I thought sixth round wouldn't be the worst option in the world. They went and got a backup for uh, Marcus Mariota. In the sixth round, maybe we'll get a backup in the sixth round again. Who would it be? I don't know. See what Luke Falk looks like. Actually, you know what's really funny? When I came to my conclusion yesterday of who the right quarterback to be to pick in the sixth round to replace or to, you know, back up Aaron Rodgers, it was Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew is the quarterback for Washington State. Uh, Last year, the quarterback for Washington State was Luke Falk. It's all coming together, man. Telling you, Gardner Minshew in the sixth. But what I actually did 
is I took Mr. Luke Falk out of Washington State, and I actually just added him to my sheet here to see where exactly he would rank. And by the way, Luke Falk would be eighth on this list. So again, running through my list, I've got Kyler Murray, Drew Locke, Gardner Minshew, Will Greer, Brett Rippian, Ryan Finley, Dwayne Haskins, and then it would be Luke Falk. But I think the best comp for him, quite possibly, would be Trace McSorley, the next guy on this list out of Penn State. The, the biggest difference between the two, Trace McSorley is a better runner. Luke Falk is a lot better under pressure. Otherwise, they stack up really closely. Now, I don't have his relative athletic score because he didn't run or do a lot of the other stuff. But I would say he lines up pretty closely to Trace McSorley. So if I had to come up with a second name for who the Packers might be looking at taking, if you know we're going to use Luke Falk, Falk as sort of our standard, might be a guy like Trace McSorley out of Penn State. So those are the two names, if we we're going to take a quarterback, that I'm now looking at. Gardner Minshew, Trace McSorley, write it down. Why? I, I don't know. Do I actually think? No, I, I less than 50%. But still, if we take one of those two, I expect 100% of the credit. That's how this works. If I get it wrong, well, duh. I mean, come on, you can't expect me to get it right. But if I get it right, then I'm a genius. It's national media, man. That's how I roll. I'm never going to get that Stephen A money if I don't start pulling tricks like this, all right? That's how you get the big bucks. Just start talking craziness. Anyways, let's look at uh, the year prior to this because that's not all that exhilarating. Let's look at his time with the Rams. This is going back to 2017. The Rams also didn't have a ton of picks. They did not have a first-round pick. But in the second round, they picked Gerald Everett, tight end, out of South Alabama. This one's kind of tough because there's. I did the same thing. I inserted him into the sheet that I already have. There really isn't anybody, and maybe I just need to add more tight ends, that fits perfectly. Now, as far as his grade, he's almost exactly identical to Isaac Nauta out of Georgia. He's also, so he's sandwiched between Jay Sternberger, somebody we know the Packers have been doing a lot of work on, and Isaac Nauta. But really, it's just the overall grade ends up the same. There's not a lot that's actually similar between them. As far as his receiving grade, he's sandwiched between Irv Smith and Foster Moreau. He had the fifth highest receiving grade in this group, which is a small group. I only have 12 tight ends. Um, He is a very good pass blocker, kind of sandwiched between Caden Smith and Foster Moreau. Maybe Foster Moreau is the guy. It actually isn't bad. I think I'm going to stick with that. There's a couple of differences. Uh, Gerald Everett has a a lot higher yards after the catch per completion, 9.1, compared to 7.4 with Foster Moreau at LSU. Foster Moreau is more uh, athletic, but they both do have high relative athletic scores. Uh, Foster Moreau, 9.48. Gerald Everett, 8.46. Overall, Foster Moreau does have an overall higher grade, but I think that's a pretty decent comp. One of the biggest differences is that the, the school that they went to, so as far as the grade, that's going to drain on Gerald Everett a little bit, is the fact that he went to South Alabama. Foster Moreau went to LSU. But that's actually going to be my comp. Now, another really big difference here, or another thing to look at that's maybe doesn't quite fit up, fit, ugh. sorry folks, brain's still not working entirely. They took Gerald Everett in the second round, meaning they really wanted to get a solid tight end. If they take Foster Moreau, as I have him here on NFLBigBoard.com, he is 174th. That's somewhere 5th, 6th round. Now, maybe he ends up going higher than that. He could be a second-round guy. It could be a shocker, one of those kinds of things. But it, it's kind of one of those, if they, they if what we learned from what they did at the Rams is that they want a really good tight end, they're going to take one earlier. If they're looking for that type of tight end, I think Foster Moreau is, is maybe that kind of a guy. So if the Packers don't have a tight end by the first round, second round, maybe third-ish round, and Foster Moreau is still sitting there, that's probably a pretty solid option. I should probably write this down somewhere because I'm not going to remember come draft day. (laughs) Somebody's going to have to remind me if they draft Foster Moreau because, again, same rules apply. We don't get him. Whatever. It's a 1 in 32 chance. If we do, I'm a genius. I expect all the credit. It's actually a pretty interesting draft class. If you look at their next pick, it was Cooper Cup. So they get a tight end, then they get a slot receiver. Kind of similar. Similar to what we might expect here as the, uh, the Green Bay Packers draft. So Cooper Cup. Eastern Washington, six foot two, two 204 pounds. Guy broke out in his final year. Uh, so in 2015, he had 246 yards. 2016, 1,704 yards. With about 50% of his uh, receptions coming in the slot. So interestingly enough, when I insert him into my sheet here, Cooper Cup is actually the lowest graded wide receiver on this list. He's 13th out of 13 wide receivers. And he actually compares relatively closely to uh, Riley Ridley. Riley Ridley is six foot two, two hundred and one pounds. Cooper Cup six foot two, two hundred and four pounds. If you look at how they compare, Cooper Cup had a terrible um, relative athletic score, three point four. Little Jordan Humphrey is actually pretty close too, with a three point five. But Riley Ridley four point four eight. They're both terrible relative athletic scores. 
Uh, their drop rates, they both did pretty, you know, real good hands for both of these guys. 4.59, 4.4 for Riley Ridley. You look at their yards after the catch, Cooper Cup 14.6, Riley Ridley 14.7. Receiving grade, um, Cooper Cup was actually quite a bit higher, which is where you could on- honestly say, that, you know, the build is different, but Cooper Cup and Lil Jordan Humphrey actually match up pretty well. Uh, 84.7 for Cooper Cup, 83.6 for Lil Jordan Humphrey. If you're looking for a little bit more of a flattering comparison, I think Kelvin Harmon out of NC State would be a, a, a little bit more of a realistic comparison as far as a guy that, that the Packers could take early that could be a Cooper Cup type player. Harmon's got a little bit of a bigger build. They're both six foot two, but Harmon's 221 pounds. But Harmon also had a pretty low relative athletic score, 4.93. Receiving grade, which is the most important metric, 84.7 for Cooper Cup, 84.4 for Kelvin Harmon. Uh, 4.59 drop rate for Cooper Cup, 4.7 for Kelvin Harmon, uh, 14.6 yards after the catch, uh, yards per completion for Cooper Cup, 15.1 for Kelvin Harmon. So pretty similar there. So I think the best comparison is probably Riley Ridley for Cooper Cup. But again, if we're looking for somebody a little bit earlier on that compares to that Cooper Cup type player, it's probably Kelvin Harmon. The uh, next guy that they took, and I'm skipping over defense just because I want to get an idea of what Matt LaFleur at least was exposed to, some of the thought process that went on at other places where he had worked. In the fourth round, they took a wide receiver out of Texas A&M by the name of Josh Reynolds. Now, Josh Reynolds isn't as big a name as Cooper Cup, so I don't exactly know how they feel about this pick. But, again, looking at a comp, this is a big body guy out of a fairly big program. And I got to be honest, the comp is not that hard to figure out. These two guys are side by side on my little sheet here. Another big body guy. Another relatively big program. Both of these guys had uh, pretty high uh, relative athletic scores. Actually, I don't even know because one didn't run, so I lied about that. Uh, Both had similar receiving grades. The guy that I'm talking about is Mr. J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. So they went and got two wide receivers. I think that's a little, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think about wide receiver. It's hard to believe we would get two in this draft class because of the other needs that we have and the fact that we have so many wide receivers. Um, I do expect that we're going to get one, and if we did get one, it would probably be somebody more of a slot guy than a J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, but just throwing it out there, Josh Reynolds is a guy that they liked. Josh Reynolds is a guy that they took in the fourth round, and uh, he does compare pretty nicely to Mr. J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. Anyways, I'm not going to go back any further in um, Matt LaFleur's career, and I also don't necessarily want to look at the defenses of these teams because I really don't think Matt LaFleur has very much, if any, input on the defense. Uh, when you listen to Matt LaFleur talk, he talks a lot about how he defers to a lot of people. He even talks about how he reaches out to his old, you know, uh, coaching, what, whatever, Sean McVay. He leans on these guys. He leans on the other uh, assistant coaches. And I think as far as defense is concerned, I, I really think that's, you know, he might have some input in terms of, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's basically nothing. He might show up to try to get these guys to understand a certain kind of tone, pace. You know, we want to be fast. We want to be this. We want to be that. But this is this is 100% Mike Pettin's defense. And we'll take a little bit of an ad break. How was that? Was that, was that fantastic? That half a second that passed? So a little bit of news and notes. Um, Tony Pauline was uh, talking about the Washington Pro Day. Mentioned that Mr. Caleb McGarry was spending a little bit of time with the Green Bay Packers. According to Pauline, um, he could be end up being a second round uh, prospect. He decided not to run any athletic drills, which makes sense because he was, I believe, the most athletic tackle that I have on my whole list here. 9.84 relative athletic score. Absolute freak. But uh, he did do some position drills. And as I said, the Packers were spending a little bit of extra time, which makes sense. You know, the, the Packers like athletic people. LaFleur especially with his outside zone is looking for athletic people. Caleb McGarry, extremely athletic offensive tackle. I talked a little bit about my list here, but just going back over it one other time. Definitely a better pass blocker than run blocker, which is the case with probably every single one of these guys for the most part. He didn't actually grade out all that well as a pass blocker out of Washington. He was ninth out of 21 that I have here on my list. Although he did grade out higher as a pass blocker than a run blocker overall, he actually proportionally graded out higher compared to the other uh, tackles as a run blocker. He graded out seventh out of all tackles behind only Jonah Williams, Dalton Reisner, Jawan Taylor, Isaiah Prince, Yadni Kajust, uh, Kajust, and David Edwards. So I, I would, I think with Caleb McGarry, what we're looking at here is 
if the Packers don't end up taking a tackle, which, again, there is no targeting. There's no such thing as targeting. The Packers are building a board. They're trying to figure out where Caleb McGarry goes. The fact that they're talking to him means that there's some interest. He's not off the board. It's a matter of when do we want to take him. For example, if if at 44 we haven't satisfied the tackle position, are we willing to take him here? Or do we want to see if he falls to the third? Or, even more importantly, if we don't take him at 44, at what point do we trade up from the third round into the end of the second round to get Caleb McGarry? Because Caleb McGarry is not going to give you what Jonah Williams or Dalton Reisner or any of these guys are going to give you. But super, super athletic again. Maybe the most athletic tackle in the entire draft class. Solid run blocker. Potentially capable pass blocker, I guess. I don't, I don't really know. Every time now I hear second round super athletic guy that's you know kind of okay as a pass blocker, I just am going to end up thinking of uh, Jason Spriggs, and I'm not going to like him. So we'll see. Casey, thanks for jumping in the uh, the old Patreon there. Just got that update. One buck is all it takes, man. You got access to everything now. Actually, I'm going to upload this, and then you'll have access to everything. But either way, again, as much as I don't necessarily. Uh, like the idea of targeting it does give you some idea of where the Packers heads are at is it impossible they take a tackle in the first couple rounds no it's not and the fact that they're talking to Caleb McGarry kind of solidifies that some other teams he spent time with Buffalo Bills New Orleans Saints Seattle Seahawks so obviously Seattle and Buffalo are, are looking pretty hard at offensive line if they end up taking them you know if Buffalo takes them in the second or Seattle takes them at the end of the first obviously there's no chance of us getting them but if he doesn't get taken by Seattle and he doesn't get taken by the Bills in the second round, something to keep an eye on. And again, especially if we end up trading back, because then, like I said, if we trade back in the first round to, you know, 19-ish, we pick up another second round uh, second round pick, who are the guys we want to take? Because there's a lot of people. So again, not targeting, but kind of looking at it from the standpoint of, do we really want to use a pick on this guy or should we use it on somebody else? we got guys like Rapp and everybody else that would be a great pick with a second-round pick. Interestingly enough, when I looked at uh, Mel Kuyper, apparently has done his mock draft. He has the first three picks for the Green Bay Packers, which looking at these picks, I'm not super impressed. DK Metcalf and Noah Fant at 30. But he has at 44, the Packers taking Caleb McGarry. So, tea leaves, man. But uh, the other interesting thing about McGarry is that he's played his entire college career at right tackle. And as much as I think a lot of us tend to think, well, it's just levels of difficulty. Whereas, you know, if you're not a very good left tackle, then you just go play right tackle. Not really. If you listen to tackles talk about it, it's kind of like, you know, switching positions is like trying to write or throw with your non-dominant hand. It's just, it's kind of a hard thing to do. So taking somebody that's a really good left tackle, that's been a dominant left tackle for their entire career and saying, he's really good, but we're just going to put him on the right side. I don't know that it's necessarily that easy. So again, the fact that we are definitely not looking to replace Balaga, and we are def or excuse me, we're not looking to replace Bakhtiari. We're definitely looking to replace Balaga in the coming years. We're looking for a right tackle. McGarry has played right tackle exclusively for Washington uh, for the entirety of his college career. So again, something to keep an eye on. Otherwise, not a whole lot going on. Jay Kumro resigned his, uh, or he was resigned. He signed his tender. That's about it. So, kind of a short episode today. I'm going to leave it at that. I know it seems like, well, it is a short episode, but I've legitimately been working on this for about two, three hours. Because every time I say I just added them to the sheet, I literally paused the episode, did all the work, and then started it again. So, I've been I've been working on this for a long time. feel like this has been a three-hour episode. So, anyways, again, please leave a rating and review if you have time. Just take a couple seconds of your time. Otherwise, enjoy your Sunday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.